Thank you. Um, thanks you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about mesoscopic transport experiment uh, with gold atoms. So um, I uh, understood it's a mixed audience, so I will try to motivate both the mesoscopic transport part, which you might be a bit more familiar uh, than uh, the cold atoms part. I'll try to motivate both. Uh, but the main idea of our work is that we would like to use neutral atoms, cold neutral atoms, as models for electrons in nanoscopic structures. And the hope is that because cold atoms operate at very different energy scales, very different length scales, um, we might be able to have different tuning knobs and hopefully learn a few things about uh, transport processes. What you see at the back here is uh, the simplest device uh, <coughs> we could think of. It's a quantum point contact here that was imprinted on a cold atomic cloud. Uh, that's something I will describe in details uh, later. Before I do that, uh, let me motivate the general idea why cold atoms might be an interesting tool in order to investigate uh, condensed matter related phenomena. Uh, the main, okay, there are two main motivations. The first one is that cold atoms are very dilute systems. That's the most important aspect, I think. Um, we operate with densities of the order of 10 to the 12 particles per cubic centimeter. And what this means is that the interparticle spacing or the Fermi wavelength, if you want, is of the order of the wavelengths of light. As a consequence, uh, we use optical techniques in order to manipulate and to observe the particles um, right down to the smallest microscopic length scale. And that's the most important tuning knob. So if you take an optical standing wave, you can make an optical lattice with a lattice spacing that's of the order of the Fermi wavelength. Um, if you make a random distribution of laser intensity, you can make this order again, which is a short correlation length compared to the, the Broglie wavelengths of the particles, and so on and so forth. And what I will talk about mainly is the ability to create mesoscopic structures, again, that operate at the smallest possible length scale. The price we pay for that, of course, is that uh, first atoms are very heavy particles, and because we have at low densities, all the energy scales are extremely low. Um, Fermi energies we have are, are of the order of microkelvins. Uh, so we use laser cooling and evaporative cooling to bring the atoms uh, to degeneracy. But everything takes place uh, in this very, very low temperature scale. The second very important aspect uh, is that uh, atoms are neutral particles, of course, uh, but they also ha are very complex particles. There is an internal structure. Um, there are many, many different energy levels. This internal structure of the atoms is what controls the mechanical effect of light onto the atoms. That's what allows us to use dipole forces um, to all the, all the laser cooling uh, processes. <coughs> it also means we have a lot of spectroscopic tools in order to understand our systems. Uh, we can do radio frequency spectroscopy, microwave, optical spectroscopy, and so on. Uh, but also, uh, Atoms interact by the van der Waals force and not by uh, long-range Coulomb interaction. And the van der Waals force, again, depends on the details of the internal structure of the atoms. In particular, there is a molecular structure in the two-body problem. I will come back to that later. But that we can control in order to change the way particles interact with each other. So with all these control tools, um, the hope is that we can sort of prepare a system which will tell us a little bit about transport properties in a general sense because we can prepare and tune the parameters in order to uh, reproduce this or that phenomenon. So uh, that's the main motivation uh, for the use of cold atoms as models for uh, transport phenomena. Um, from the cold atom perspective, of course, what we would like to do in the end is, is prepare a quantum gas system uh, with a certain interactions, geometry, and so on. And we'd like to understand what happens there. And, uh, in many cases, uh, in particular when interactions are strong, uh, we don't really know uh, how the system behaves. And what we usually do um, is a scattering experiment. So we prepare our system and we send photons. Uh, photons are scattered. We collect that uh, on, the, on the CCD camera, and that's the primary source of information we have. <coughs> the way we think about transport um, is essentially the same way, and that's the picture we borrow from mesoscopic physics, is that it's also a scattering experiment, except in your system, you want to inject the atoms themselves. 
um, see what happens, and in particular, see how many of these atoms actually make their way through. Um, and the again, the way to think about this is that uh, you want to attach your system to a source and a drain, that's sort of the minimal, the minimal instance. Um, and since we are dealing with fermionic atoms, um, we'll think about the source and the drain as being fermi distributed like this. Uh, and the transport uh, experiment consists in introducing a chemical potential difference, so a shift of the Fermi level of this side compared to this one. And that's again a spectroscopy experiment. Uh, why? Because, well, uh, you see that uh, if you count energy by energy, um, the current of atoms that are located in these energy levels is exactly balanced by the ones that are populating this one. So all the net current you see through your system actually originates from this very narrow region here on top of the Fermi surface. That is something which is very well known in condensed matter physics. <coughs> but it means you're actually probing in an energy resolved way uh, your quantum gas system. And that's extremely important uh, because all the many body physics in a Fermi gas takes place actually right there. Uh, because Pauli blocking prevents anything from happening to the atoms that are uh, located well below the Fermi level. Uh, and in fact, uh, many of the most important uh, uh, transport phenomena that are known in, in condensed matter physics were actually discovered by uh, DC transport experiments, uh, simply because it's so sensitive to the many body physics because it probes the system exactly where the thing takes place. So that was the motivation for us uh, to bring uh, cold atomic systems into this regime where we can do this type of transport experiments. So this is uh, what I plan to uh, tell you. So I will first describe the uh, system which we have investigated, that's a quantum point contact, uh, which is arguably the, the simplest system, um, which the system, the, the simplest mesoscopic device that has genuinely quantum properties. <coughs> I will show you in particular uh, the transport measurement technique which we have developed and our main observation, which is quantized conductance, which is the expected behavior of the quantum point contact. And then I will show you a few examples uh, of what happens when you take this system and everything else equal, you increase the interactions uh, in a way which I'm going to explain. So I will tell you how this works, what happens to quantized conductance as interactions are increased, um, and a few things about new tools we have developed in order to further manipulate interacting systems by the projection of mesoscopic optical lattices. And if time permits, uh, I will talk about the future prospects, which is mainly summarizing the limitations of this method and tell you a bit more about the system we are developing right now at EPFL in order to make a new generation of experiments that, that hopefully will uh, strongly improve compared to, uh, to these, uh, these experiments. I should also say, <coughs> um, these experiments were performed at ETH Zurich uh, in the group of Tilman Nesslinger, even though now I'm uh, setting up a new uh, lab at EPFL and that's, uh, that part is going to deal with, uh, with that future prospect. So let's start with the, the system itself. And the, the starting point, sort of the material which we are using, is a, uh, a cloud of uh, lithium-6 atoms. So lithium-6 atoms are fermionic atoms. And uh, what you see here is an absorption picture. So this is really, we prepare the cloud in vacuum, we send the laser, which is resonant with the atoms, and we record the shadow onto the CCD camera. And what you see here are regions of high optical density, which are regions where we have a lot of atoms. And the cloud has this shape, um, which reflects the trap which we are using, which tightly confines the atoms in this direction and loosely confines in this direction. Uh, we have about 100,000 atoms. Um, we cool this cloud down to the lowest temperature we can achieve, which turn out to be roughly 10% of the Fermi temperature, which brings us in the regime of 50 nanokelvin, 50 to 100 nanokelvins. Um, uh, to be fair, this is also close to the lowest temperature we can actually measure. Um, but in most cases, everything is consistent with having these temperatures, which we think as degenerate, but of course, uh, one has to take it with a grain of salt because uh, depending on what you compare with, that might actually uh, qualify as high temperature in some situations. Um, these, uh, these atoms, they exist in two different, uh, well, in many different hyperfine states. Uh, this is here a mixture of two hyperfine states of the atom. So there are internal degree of freedom of the atom. We think of it as spin. It's some internal degree of freedom of the particles. Whenever I will say spin, it's really an in this internal degree of freedom, which is hyperfine. That is really a relative orientation of the nuclear spin and the uh, electron spin in the atoms. For all practical purposes, um, it doesn't matter 
except that when particles will start interacting with each other, of course, interaction takes place uh, between particles of different spins. Because with parallel spin, uh, it's not possible due to Pauli principle. OK, so that's the cloud which we, uh, with which we start. And then uh, from this, we carve out our point contact uh, by sending a combination of laser beams. Uh, so this is uh, schematically how it works. So we send beams that intersect to the center, and we tune the wavelengths of, this, uh, of these beams in such a way that they expel particles from the high-intensity region. So we send beams uh, that have a profile that looks like this. So there is high intensity here, high intensity down. When what this produces is that atoms are expelled, so they are confined in this uh, very tiny region here. And since we cross two of these beams, right here at the center, we have a narrow region uh, where the confinement is very strong. Uh, and these beams, they intersect only at the center. So at the side, um, you have something which is essentially an unperturbed cloud. <coughs> and this is our uh, mesoscopic device. So that's the thing which we are interested in from now on. And the rest of the cloud here and here, which are essentially unperturbed, displays the role of reservoirs or drain and source, uh, which we can use to inject and collect particles um, that cross the, uh, the channel here. We have a lot of control over the channel, so uh, this is a high-resolution microscope, so we can project some intensity patterns here in order to tune the way the thing exactly looks like. We also have this red beam, which is depicted here. That's something which allows us to tune the density of particles in the contact, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the channel. So basically, when we increase the strength of this laser, this is something we call gate potential, uh, simply because it changes locally the density, and that does not affect the reservoir. So that's a very convenient tool. We can change the chemical potential in such a way uh, as to make measurement, for example, as a function of chemical potential in the channel without having to worry about what happens to the size. So this is the, uh, the pattern. And now the transport experiment, uh, it looks like this. So we start with a certain number of atoms in this one, uh, and a certain number of atoms are on the right. And what we do is, during the preparation process, uh, we are actually introducing a little bit more particles in one reservoir than in the other. Uh, that we do during preparation by shifting the trap and uh, restoring the symmetry afterwards. And then the transport experiment simply consists in waiting as long as we can, which means a couple of seconds before well, all the optics start to misalign, the coils heat up, and so on. Um, and after a few seconds, uh, we take a picture which destroys the system and tells us how many particles we have on each of the reservoirs. And now the measurement is simply, well, we count how many of the extra particles we have added here have actually made their way through. If at the end of the day we see that there are equal number of particles on both sides and we know some current has been flowing, uh, and by adjusting how, how long we wait, we can actually measure the current that is driven through the system this way. Simply by counting particles, it's a destructive measurement. So every time we, we want to compare uh, uh, transport in different situations, we have to produce a new sample. <coughs> but we rely on the reproducibility of the experiment in order to make uh, reliable measurements. Once we know the current, we can also deduce um, how much uh, chemical potential bias was introduced by adding these extra particles. To know that, we just need to know uh, the density of state if we have non-interacting particles. So that converts basically atom number into chemical potential on the left and on the right. And then we have a chemical potential difference, which we compare with the current, and that gives us a conductance. So when, when we say uh, we measure conductance, that's really this, what, what this means. Of course, if you have interacting particles, essentially you need to know the equation of state. Uh, to the thermodynamics of the system in order to be able to convert atom number differences into chemical potential differences. And that is something we have to take from somewhere else. But once we know that, we can make conductance measurements. So every time I'm going to say um, we measure the conductance of this or that system as a function of this or that parameter, that's really the experiment uh, which I'm thinking about. So um, these are the numbers we achieve for this particular structure. Um, I think the details do not really matter. The point is that temperature here, 42 nanokelvin, is an order of magnitude below the smallest trap frequency along this direction. So it's much smaller um, than the spacing between vibrational states uh, in the contact. And that's what allows us um, to resolve the contribution of each of the vibrational mode to transport. That gives rise to quantized conductance. <coughs> 
So this is the conductance here of this structure measured as a function of confinement. So that's one of these frequencies here, uh, the, the, the one in the x direction. Uh, we've tuned the chemical potential using this extra uh, gate beam in such a way that uh, for the largest confinement we can achieve, 50 kilohertz, um, the point contact is completely closed. Uh, so it's empty, conductance is zero. But as we open the contact, we see conductance going up and then saturating here to a value which is one over Planck's constant, which is the conductance quantum for neutral particles. Uh, we are measuring uh, currents in particles per second, and we are measuring bias not in volts, but in uh, energy units. And if you do that, the quantum of conductance is not e squared over h, but it's just 1 over h. <coughs> and it stays at 1 over h for some time until the second mode comes in. A third one you might guess that there is here. Afterwards, of course, we have modes uh, becoming available simultaneously along the two directions, uh, which means the conductance is going up quite uh, strongly. But the quantization is very clearly seen here. The, the, the red data here is simply shifted by two units there. It's for slightly different configuration where the, the frequency is slightly reduced. The length of the plateau is smaller accordingly. Uh, but that is something which is very robust. And that, uh, that's now something we do routinely uh, in the lab to calibrate the experiment, actually. The solid line you see here is the Landauer formula. Uh, there are no free parameters. In particular, the transition from one plateau to the next, which you see here, this is entirely due to finite temperature. Uh, again, I mean, as I told you, temperature um, is finite and, and quite high from the condensed matter physics standard. Uh, and you see this is uh, something which is nicely reproduced. The length of the plateau is also nicely reproduced. These are all, all these numbers here, temperature and so on. This is fitted uh, in separate experiments. So um, this is uh, quite nice. Uh, we can give a qualitative understanding for the quantization, uh, basically based on the simple uh, uh, picture that is there. So if you have here very low temperature Fermi gas on both sides, and you see the net current comes from this region here in energy, um, that's essentially a square window. So when you Fourier transform this, uh, you get in time a set of wavelets uh, which are separated by h over delta mu. So delta mu is simply the width in energy uh, between these two guys. <coughs> and now, if you're at very low temperature, each of these quantum states here is populated by one and only one particle. Therefore, when you do this change of phases, you also have one particle and only one in each of these uh, wave packets. And you just have to count. Uh, the number of particles you get here per unit time, uh, and that gives you the current, and the current is simply delta mu over h. So this is just a consequence of Pauli principle plus the Heisenberg relation. Yes? So this is used with only one hyperfine state? Yes, yeah, so here we all always refer the current to one of the hyperfine states. Actually, there are two hyperfine states, otherwise we cannot cool down the system because there is no thermal equilibration mechanism. Uh, but we only measure one spin state at, at a time, and we always refer everything to one spin state. So thanks for this, uh, this remark. So that's, uh, that's again the Landauer formula. I want to point that um, there's n this has nothing to do with charges, with electric fields, and so on. Okay? I mean, this is something which uh, works perfectly for neutral particles. Uh, of course, if you have several modes, you can just count independently each of the possible modes uh, that can carry current from one side to the other. So you multiply this by the number of available modes, uh, and that gives you the pattern that uh, uh, I showed you before. Uh, again, the Landauer formula is simply this plus finite temperature, and this is what allows us to uh, um, to fit this data. There's nothing more complicated. So <coughs> this is something we are pretty happy about. First, um, it's the first time that was observed uh, for neutral particles. Um, and the second thing which we are very happy about is that it tells us that the technique we have to measure conductance actually gives us something which is exactly the same as what you would measure in an electronic device. So this means now our cold dynamic system, op which is you know, in vacuum, operates at completely different energy scales, time scales, and so on. Uh, still, it gives you the same kind of information. So you can use one to understand the other, or you can take inspiration from one uh, to try to do something in the other. Uh, that is something which is very precious for us. So, so far, so good. Um, I'm just uh, uh, starting from this point, because that's a point which we understand pretty well. Um, but of course, the question is now what happens as you start to have particles interacting with each other. So I will go back to here. And now I'm going to explain quickly how this mechanism of control of interaction actually works. So as I said, uh, atoms interact by the van der Waals potential, uh, which is uh, 1 over R6 at long distances. It's a short-range interaction in three dimensions. 
<coughs> so um, the idea is that uh, you have potential, these are the, the potential curves for different spin combina uh, uh, combinations. So the atoms have one electron on the outer shell, and depending on whether the spin uh, of the outer electron is parallel or anti-parallel or triplet and singlet combination, you get two different potentials here. Okay? Um, so you have an open channel, which is uh, you know, the particles the way they are uh, at uh, long distances. And what happens is that um, you can have bound states here in the closed channel, which is usually the spin-singlet configuration. Right? Now, because this is singlet and this is triplet configuration of the electrons, when you put a homogeneous magnetic field, this one is shifted compared to this one, okay? uh, simply by Zeeman shift. Therefore, um, you can have the situation where one of these bound states becomes very, very close to the dissociation threshold of the open channel. And if there is any mechanism that mixes the two channels, like hyperfine splitting, for example, then you get a scattering resonance by which the atoms in the open channel, they come, they hybridize a little bit with the molecular state uh, before coming out. And that's a mechanism which produces a divergence of the, sc of the scattering length. This is the fishback resonance. Uh, that, that's the sort of microscopic phenomenon. Uh, for all practical purposes, what this means is that by changing the homogeneous magnetic field in the experiment, we can change the way atoms interact with each other. Um, so now the precise properties depend on the spin configuration, depends on which particular atom we are using. For lithium atoms, it turns out that this phenomenon is extremely strong. <coughs> you see here the scattering length as a function of magnetic field for the spin configuration we have in the experiment. And you see that uh, you can work here at the at magnetic field of about 550 Gauss where the scattering length is very low. Scattering length is very low means the interactions are weak. And this is the situation um, which I showed you before, right? We have essentially non-interacting particles which just keep a finite value of the scattering length, otherwise we cannot reach thermal equilibrium. And now we can perform exactly the same experiment going here. Uh, this is the so-called BCS to BEC crossover, and that's a regime where the scattering length is negative and it uh, gets more, larger and larger up to the point where you get the unitary limit in which interactions is as strong as possible. And the remarkable thing, and that's only true for lithium atoms uh, because of their particular molecular structure, is that the system remains stable all the way down here. So you can prepare the same system, vary the scattering length in a systematic way, and nothing happens. The system doesn't decay, doesn't heat up, and so on. Uh, we can just perform the same experiments. Um, I should say that in order to interpret our measurements, we need the equation of state of the gas in this regime, in particular in the strongly interacting state. And this is something, of course, uh, which you can either try to calculate, it's quite a formidable task, or we take it from precision measurements that were performed uh, by the group of Christoph Salomon in 2010. Uh, so we know the equation of state with a few percent accuracy, and this is something uh, which we put in, into uh, our data analysis in order to be able to convert the change in particle number into potential differences. And that's the way we get to, uh, uh, to conductance measurement. <coughs> There's a lot which is known about the nature of the system uh, in this uh, BCS to BEC crossover for the last 10, 15 years. This was really extensively studied in our community. Um, I will just say a few words about this. Um, what we know is that all the way through here, interactions are attractive between the atoms. What this means is that if you have, you know, you have fermions with attractive interactions uh, at low temperatures, uh, you get a superfluid state, you get Cooper pairing. So Cooper pairing in the sense of BCS when you have very weak attraction, so that's this limit here where the scattering length is pretty low. Uh, but this smoothly converts the system from uh, very few Cooper pairs making the system superfluid into something that's a gas that's entirely formed of tightly bound molecules as you cross over here. This is something which is well understood. Uh, it's a smooth crossover. The system stays superfluid all the way through. It's an S-wave superfluid. That is something which is relatively simple to, uh, to understand. Um, so it's, it's important to notice also that uh, you have chemically bound molecules only for magnetic fields below the resonance. Otherwise, the pairs you get here are Cooper pairs, which means that uh, if you take just the two-body problem, there is actually no bound state. So, um, okay, this is the, uh, uh, the end of the story, sort of. That's the conductance of our point contact here as a function of gate potential. So think of it as chemical potential in the channel, if you want, and interaction strength. So 
again, gate potential being low means chemical potential is low. This uh, blue region here is the regime where the point contact is empty and nothing happens. Um, this is one of our, so KF is the Fermi wave vector and A is the scattering length. So this regime here down is the weak interaction regime, or we moderately weak, let's say. And that's the regime where uh, this thing here uh, is kind of the, uh, what remains of the conductance plateau in the interacting regime. The regime you have here um, is a regime where the conductance is extremely large. It's actually larger than what we can measure, and I will come to that uh, uh, in a moment. <coughs> this is something which is the superfluid regime. Of course, we are working at finite temperature. So if you start at finite temperature at fixed chemical potential, say somewhere here, um, of course, as you increase attractive interaction, at some point you will cross the superfluid phase transition. This is simply because if you have fixed density and fixed temperature, you increase the interactions. Well, that's uh, how you, you reach the superfluid state. And the dashed line here um, is the best theory that was available at that time uh, for where the transition is supposed to be. Again, that's a theory which is quite complicated because it contains the strongly interacting regime. Okay. And you see that indeed, at the point where roughly we cross this line, we start to see a conductance which shoots up dramatically. Um, this is a single mode point quantum point contact, and you see the scale here, right? So, so we have very large, uh, very large currents. So let me say a few words about the superfluid regime here. Um, that's a regime actually where uh, we have nonlinear response to uh, the potential difference. If you have a superconductor and you put a voltage on top uh, onto it, you immediately get a large response. Uh, and that is something which uh, we also observe in the experiment. So we studied this for the particular case of the unitary Fermi gas, where uh, A is infinity here. Um, that makes our life easy uh, because the system is scale invariant, and that's the system which we know best. <coughs> so at unitarity, we measured the current as a function of chemical potential difference. Um, it's quite a difficult thing because it implies taking the derivative of experimental data, because remember, we just measure directly atom number differences. So you measure atom number differences for different chemical potential difference, uh, and that you have to, uh, uh, to take the derivative of that in order to get the current. That's why you get all these wiggles and this noise. Uh, but what you see from this, these are data for different chemical potentials. All of them show this, no this nonlinearity here. Um, which is something um, that after discussing with our colleagues from uh, Geneva, uh, we could associate with the superfluid character of the system. Uh, and indeed, this is the, uh, the theory which is based on multiple Andreev reflection that was worked out by Thierry Giamarchi and his uh, postdoc at that time, Shu uh, which fits our data. So there, of course, at unitarity, we know the pairing gap, so we can normalize uh, the current by the pairing gap. Uh, we also know the equation of state. We know as much as we can. So the only thing which is fitted on this data is the transmission coefficient of the channel, uh, which turns out to be very large. I think it was 96 to 98 uh, percent probability of transmission, which is again consistent with the fact that we have a very nice uh, quantization of conductance uh, that is measured uh, in the non-interacting state. So this tells us a little bit about the mechanisms uh, that take place uh, in the superfluid state when interactions are very strong. Of course, I mean, this is not a proof that we have indeed multiple Andreev reflection. We don't see the subharmonic structure, uh, the, the, uh, the small peak uh, that we should have. This is a regime where the contact is very, very close to 100% transmission. Um, so what we can say is that this gives us a hint for what is actually happening in the channel. But for, for, of course, bulletproof uh, demonstration that we have on the F reflection would require much more precise measurement. And you see, this is sort of the error bars we have on the current that doesn't really allow us to see fine uh, details. Can you tune the transmission? Yeah, we can tune the transmission. Uh, I mean, that qu very quickly brings the current to zero. Uh, but yes, I mean, th th there's nothing more we can see, actually. Uh, in that. And then how do you expect to see steps double the size of the non um, So here, of course, the, the reservoirs are becoming superfluid and the channel as well. So everything gets superfluid at the same time. So you're referring to Andreev reflections. Uh, you can make a uh, It's not easy to do that because interactions is tuned in a homogeneous way. Um, yeah, so the condition for becoming superfluid depends on the confinement Yes, exactly. It depends on the confinement. What turns out is that uh, it's probably more the other way around, that because of confinement, the tendency to form pairs is actually enhanced. So uh, I will show you later some data uh, which 
we can interpret this way, uh, where we see a plateau which is actually shifted to higher, uh, higher values of the conductance. I will show you this later. But, but even there, it's not so easy to account directly for the multimode character together with the confinement and interactions. And that, that, that I will come to that right now because um, this is the regime which now we would characterize as normal. But if you look in details, um, uh, it's quite questionable how normal this actually is. Uh, in particular, uh, you can look here at fixed interaction strength. So this is now you know, the same data as I showed you before with the quantized conductance. Right? And now with interactions uh, relatively weak in this regime, we see the conductance plateau uh, pretty much where it should be. As we increase interactions, uh, we start to see some deviations that the plateau goes up, uh, but it's sort of still there. And as we approach unitarity, we start to see very strong deviations. Um, so this is now a plateau that's roughly at 2.5. Um, and you have, w whenever you reach actually close to unitarity, the plateau just starts to disappear until you reach there, this point where uh, essentially no sign of quantized conductance can be visible anymore. Um, so this is, of course, the conductance um, per spin state, right? Um, so as far as I understand, um, Andreev reflection would explain something that would go up to two. So a doubling of the, uh, of the conductance. Now, something that continuously goes up here, that is something which puzzled us a little bit. Um, and I should say, now that there are quite, uh, uh, quite a few explanations that have been put forward, so I cite <coughs> these papers here. Uh, all these papers actually have uh, fit to our data, which work reasonably well. In this regime, I should also say we've measured spin conductance, which shows a sparing in a way that's consistent also with this, measure, with this, uh, this theory. So in this theory here is exactly what I just referred to, um, is that in the channel, the, abili the, 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 the ability to make pairs is actually enhanced. And therefore, you might have Andreev reflections at the entrance and exit of the system. And that is something that was worked out by Leonid Glatzman, Eugene Daimler, and their postdoc, uh, Martin. <coughs> and that fits our data both for the spin transport and for this, uh, this stuff here. You have also another possibility, uh, which is that you don't actually need anything special to happen in the channel. But what you can do is that, I mean, even since you are so strongly interacting, even above the critical temperature, you have quite strong superfluid fluctuations in the reservoirs. You don't have long range order, but these fluctuations, um, they can also contribute to transport. Uh, and you can calculate the contribution of the fluctuation to transport, which was done in these two papers with two different techniques. And indeed, you get that generically, um, the spin conductance goes down and the particle conductance goes up in this way. Um, I think the reality is probably that we have a combination of the two, um, but these are things which are hard to study in details. And I think now my colleagues in Zurich have the possibility to tune the interactions in the channel independently of the interactions in the leads. So that is something which we would like to develop also in the future experiment, because that would allow us to go from the regime where you are reservoir dominated to the regime where you're channel dominated and investigate it that, uh, and investigate that in the future. Uh, Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, when you change the interaction, uh, are you still in the linear response regime? Yeah, so that is something we checked. So here the response is non-linear. Okay, uh, that's what I showed you before with the IV curve. So basically, we make uh, we make a fit to the IV curve and check the chi-square, for example. So in this case, it's always linear. It's linear until here, actually. So we have actually in the supplementary information of this paper, there is the, the fit with the linear response. As far as we can see, because you see error bars are quite large, I don't want to be too assertive on that, but as far as we can see, this takes place in the uh, linear response regime. Yes. Which doesn't tell us that if you would look in very, very great details, you wouldn't see any deviations. But. Uh, does one somehow see that the linear response uh, regime shrinks down? Um, as you go to the unitality point, shrinks down. You becomes mean? smaller in terms of the applied uh, chemical potential difference. Um, that is something which is hard to check. Um, actually, uh, okay. The way this works technically is that uh, we measure, we prepare a certain bias, which is typically large. So, by large, I mean you know twenty percent of the chemical of the uh, Fermi energy, and then we let this relax as a function of time which gives us this curve delta n as a function of time. If you take the derivative of that, um, you get the IV, uh, the IV curves I showed you. Now, of course, um, 
if you look at very large bias, it always looks linear. So you can always say, well, it looks like an exponential decay. We've tried to do it the other way around. It's not much more precise, you know, by preparing the bias. So the only thing we can say is that if we try to fit this with exponentials, which is what you would expect uh, for linear response, we start to see strong deviations only in this regime here. But to be fair, I think there I don't, I don't know. So, um, well, I'm not saying much more about this topic. Uh, I just want to come to a next step, uh, which we have implemented uh, quite recently, which is the ability to control really the microscopic potential landscape inside the contact itself. Um, so this involves an, ex uh, an extra set of laser beams. Uh, but what we do here is we use the high resolution microscope that we have and we project onto the channel a combination of potential barriers. And we make them small enough um, that they act as, as tunnel barriers, basically. So we have a finite uh, amount of tunneling through them. This is something which we had investigated before. <coughs> and now we have the ability to combine uh, effects of interactions and effects of interferences, uh, which come from the scattering of all the different uh, uh, scatterers that are in the channel. Uh, and if we do this uh, lattice-like arrangement, so we can change the number of uh, barriers that we put, uh, that's the typical things that we get. Essentially, we see band structure. I mean, what else you should, should you get? Uh, this is something with, uh, which, again, operates in a regime where the lattice is very weak. So it's essentially almost free particles, plus a bit of Bragg reflection when the Bragg condition is fulfilled. And this is now, again, the conductance as a function of chemical potential or gate potential here, where the empty point contact is there. We see the conductance going up and down afterwards. And this regime here is where we think the band gap actually is. Um, the reason why this is uh, really smooth and not, you know, sharp things, which is what you would expect if you had a nice band structure, is again finite temperature. Uh, we have a temperature which is not much smaller than the recoil energy. It's certainly not small compared to the bandwidth. And this is all, it's all smooth in our, uh, our data. Uh, but nevertheless, we see this regime, which we think is characteristic of, of having a band, uh, a band gap. And we can play with that. In particular, we can control the number of barriers. So we can measure, for example, conductance as a function of the number of scatterers. Um, this is uh, what you get here, conductance as a function of the number of barriers for different values uh, of the chemical potential. We fit this with exponentials. Uh, we can analyze this the way you want. I mean, not that we think exponentials are particularly uh, indicated here. It's just a way for us uh, to get uh, uh, information about the typical length scale. We can get, for example, the uh, conductance per unit length. So how the conductance varies when we increase the length. It doesn't vary here. And then as soon as we cross to the band gap, it varies by essentially one quanta per extra barrier, which is in the regime of parameters where we are. Um, but that indicates something which is a very good insulator. And we can even uh, measure this length scale here uh, as a function of uh, gate potential, where we also see a point where um, well, the penetration length is minimal, which corresponds to the place where we expect the band gap. Yes, okay. This is within the error bars. Um, you see, this is again the situation where we prepare uh, the, uh, uh, the imbalance at the beginning. Of course, every picture we take destroys the system. So we prepare, we don't know exactly how much we prepare. We only know uh, we do the same thing from one experiment to the next. And at some point, of course, you have fluctuations where when there is no current, sometimes it appears as if you had a bit more. This you should really, I mean, the scatter here, which kind of is reflected by the error bars you see here, um, this is purely statistical preparation of the system. Um, I don't think there is no, there's no particular meaning here. I mean, here, for all practical purposes, the two reservoirs are dissociated. Um, so this really reflects our inability to measure very low currents in the end. So, um, OK, that is something which is nice. I mean, this size scaling, uh, this is something we can do now with the system. I want to say that the, uh, the, the potential structure we project is something we actually program. So this is a programmable hologram we have in the experiment, uh, where we basically literally um, design the potential landscape. Uh, you type it in the Python program, and it makes it for the atoms. That's as simple as that once you've implemented the um, the, the projection algorithm. That is something which is very powerful because that brings us into the regime where we can really change the parameters essentially at will. What we've done now again is take the same uh, system and vary the interactions. 
Um, and there, the thing uh, which is quite striking is that uh, you remember before putting uh, interactions at some point when you approach unitarity, all the conductance quantization breaks down and you end up in the superfluid regime. We see nothing like this as soon as we have the lattice. What we see instead, so, uh, okay, there is a forest of points here. The black points are very close to unitarity. This is very large scattering length. Um, this is relatively low scattering length, so you still see this pattern here, and the pattern stays, even with, with the relatively large uh, error bars that we have. So basically, no matter how strongly uh, you make the interactions, um, you always have this pattern that conductance goes up and down here, which indicates that the regime where the system behaves as an insulator seems to persist whatever you do. Um, that is, again, something which uh, we found quite puzzling, so we turn uh, again to our colleagues uh, from Geneva, um, and here is roughly the, inter the interpretation. So now this is very cartoonesque, uh, but uh, suppose you have uh, your contact in which you have your spin up and spin down particles. Um, as you put interactions, uh, at some point you start to form Cooper pairs, and uh, the Cooper pairs, they can carry the supercurrent in the channel, and that's what gives rise to this very large enhancement of the transport. Now, if you have a lattice, then what happens is that um, even the weakest lattice you have if the density is commensurate, atoms will happily sit one spin up, one spin down together on, one, on, on each of the lattice side. That's a band insulator. That's what corresponds to the situation where you're in the band gap. And of course, once you are there, it doesn't matter whether particles strongly attract each other or weakly attract each other. You always have something which behaves as an insulator. And that is something uh, which uh, you can put on firm theory ground, uh, which was done by, uh, by Thierry. Uh, and this is called the luther emery liquid in which you have this spin-up and spin-down fermion which attract each other. And that's a theory which indeed predicts that even the weakest lattice at uh, commensurate density pins down uh, the system and makes you an insulator. And that is something which is robust to interactions even when you bring interactions to unitarity. Again, this is an interpretation of our experiment. Um, you could argue that, uh, well, there might be other mechanisms at play. Um, you can compare in regimes where the theory can be done uh, in a reasonable way, you can compare the data uh, with the, uh, uh, the theory expectations, and at least qualitatively, the main features are reproduced. Um, of course, here it's hard, uh, I mean, Thierry would probably comment on that, but uh, you cannot extend the theory to a regime of very low densities or to the multi-mode regime, but the existence of this uh, uh, region where conductance decreases and has a minimum as a function of chemical potential, this is nicely reproduced. Uh, so again, we think here uh, that what we are seeing is this spinning phenomenon. Um, and this is something uh, which uh, we are quite happy about because I think this was the first time that was also uh, observed, uh, this luther emery uh, kind of physics. <coughs> now, um, I stop there. I just want to advertise a little bit more of the, the other experiments which I did not talk about. This is just to illustrate the capabilities. Uh, and some of the limitations to which I will come to later. So you can in particular introduce temperature differences between the reservoirs and measure the heat transport and the thermal power. That is something which uh, we have actually done. That's the last experiment I did together with my colleagues in Zurich. Uh, and in the strongly interacting regime, you get uh, well, some interesting features. <coughs> you can study in more details the superfluid flow. I, I alluded a bit to that. And we can also measure spin transport. Basically, you, say, you, you put a chemical potential difference that's opposite for the two spin states. And therefore, uh, you can compare the spin currents and the particle currents. So that is something which, uh, which can also be done. Um, and okay, I, I point to a review article which we wrote recently that summarizes all these different experiments and the uh, experimental techniques we have developed. So now, in the last few minutes, I just want to uh, uh, explain a little bit about the uh, possible uh, prospects for uh, future developments. The main point I want to, uh, to bring here is that the measurement technique we have so far, which involves you know, preparing the system, waiting for a uh, current to take place, and taking an absorption picture to destroy the thing, this is something which is uh, very prone to noise because it involves sample-to-sample -sample comparison. And in particular, if you had to design, you know, regardless of, of experimental consideration, if you had to design a transport, you would never do that. Because th that implies, I mean, that's the same thing as saying if I want to know if this object is a conductor or not, I connect it to a battery, I wait as long as I can, and then I come back, dismantle the battery, and check if the battery has discharged. 
Um, that is something you would never do. Um, what you would and, and that's actually what is responsible for all these big error bars. This is entirely statistical. This is all the preparation noise that feeds into the measurement. The error bars are actually independent of whether I have current or not, and we have actually measured them in details. It's 100% uncorrelated shot-to-shot -shot fluctuations. Uh, and if you have a 1% preparation noise, uh, which is kind of the best you have in the community, um, you know, 100,000 particles, a chemical potential difference in te of 10 kilohertz, which is roughly 10% of the Fermi energy, so you cannot go much higher. Um, then, if you have a fully open point contact, you have a current of 1,000 particles per second. And 1,000 particles per second, if you can wait one second, that's 1% 1 of your total atom number. So the signal you're actually looking at is a 1% shot-to-shot uh, fluctuations of this total atom number that you have prepared. And that's why it's so sensitive to noise. <coughs> and that's basically the signal to noise you see here. So if you average enough, uh, you can reduce these error bars, uh, but you don't reduce them by, by a lot. Um, so what you would like to do, probably, if you were to design an experiment which is dedicated to make transport measurements, is uh, consider again this system and have some way to look at particles and to count how many particles enter and leave your conductor. And if you can do it in real time, basically there you have access really to the full current spectrum of your system. And that is something we think we can do. Um, Basically, uh, what we would like to develop is this uh, concept here where we measure the number of atoms in the reservoir in real time in a non-destructive way. That is something which is quite challenging, but fortunately, um, we know how to make quantum non-demolition measurement of atom number uh, because, well, there are 20 years of quantum optics have told us exactly how to do that, and you need a high finesse cavity uh, in order to perform this operation. <coughs> so the point is, uh, we can actually do this, uh, develop this, so we've put some numbers on that. Uh, but the main point is that it's possible to make this non-destructive measurement of atom number here, um, regardless of the interaction strengths. Uh, that's not completely obvious, uh, so that was uh, calculated by uh, Shun Uchino and Masahito Ueda. You can actually calculate the heating rate due to uh, measurement as a function of interaction strengths, and you get a result uh, which you can calculate for any value of interaction, and that's non-perturbative in the interaction. That makes use of something which is called TANS relations, um, which basically connects the thermodynamics uh, uh, to this uh, uh, measurement back action. Uh, so there exists a regime, regardless of interactions, where uh, it's possible to do this uh, non-demolition measurements without having too much heating. So that's the first good sign. Um, the second uh, thing is that now, if you're able to do that, well, you can compute in a very easy way what is the noise spectrum you should get as a result of measurement back action. So basically, you have two, uh, you have basically a reservoir in which you count atom number, right? There's a conjugate variable which is essentially phase. So every time you make a measurement of atom number, this phase is fluctuating, and the phase is actually uh, essentially related to the chemical potential difference. So basically, every time you measure the atom number, you get fluctuations of the bias, and that is something you can write down, even I can do it. Uh, so you get uh, this kind of balance. You have here measurement back action. That's here the admittance of the channel. I don't want to comment the details, but you have a balance between back action and measurement shot noise, which is simply the fact that you send a finite number of photons, so you get a finite amount of information about transport every time you measure, and you can put this together and write something which is very, which looks a lot like the standard quantum limit you have for measurements, for example, of the position of an oscillator or this kind of things. So we think this is kind of the absolute limit, that's what you obtain when you have a strictly QND measurement, time resolved of the atom number in a reservoir. <coughs> um, and this is uh, how uh, it looks like in the lab for the moment. So we are still uh, setting up the machine. Um, and you have here the cold atom experiment as it looked in full. Um, and here you have the cavity, this is a high finesse cavity that's sitting inside here. We obtained laser cooled atoms already in January. We hope that uh, by the end of this year, we will be at the point where we can start do this, uh, doing these measurements. So uh, with that, I reached the end. So I will thank the people who worked on this project at ETH Zurich. They are still working on that and improving the experiment. Uh, our theory collaborators on this project, Thierry Giamarchi and Piotr uh, Grigin from Geneva. And I want to thank also the, the students and postdocs I have now at EPFL who are developing the machine and my theory colleagues from Tokyo. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>